about this? Well, some scientific publications, just to show you that other scientists agree with us. He says over here, 20 million years of erosion in Australia. Some areas, even more remarkable, 200 million years of erosion, epigene attack, and that these rocks are even still there. The survival of these paleoforms is in some degree an embarrassment to all the commonly accepted models of landscape development. Why are they still there? This one over here says, two rock layers, one Paleocene, the other Eocene. I could see them perfectly. There's the one, there's the other one. Outcrops, excellent. But I couldn't find, even at close inspection, that 15 million year old gap. No sign of there ever having been a surface. Here's another scientific pu publication. It says, well, the limestone seas that spread in the, in the past over the earth were incredibly flat areas of the world. So the world was different according to these. Here's another one which says, and if this was ever the surface of the earth, like they say, why is there no deep leaching? Why is there no scour channeling residual gravels? Why doesn't it appear as if it was the surface of the earth? Okay, let's put another model together. It's pouring cats and dogs. It's the flood. And the fountains of the deep are breaking loose and the water cascades and mud flows start flowing over the earth as the water rises. And the mud flows with each earthquake. Do you know what happens in South America if there is a major rainstorm and there's a mud flow? What happens to some of the towns and cities? gone. And do the people have time to get away? No, they're buried instantly. Okay. So let's assume all this is happening and slowly the continent is even being depressed and huge earthquakes and mudslides and rain and chaos like you have never seen it before. We're going to simulate it here. This is called the turbidity current. It's an underwater or shallow water mud flow. In 1929, there was one of those off the coast of North America and a piece of the continental shelf broke loose and it soared under the ocean, a wall of mud <laughs> flowing under the ocean at a speed that after three hours, three minutes, let's make it three hours, it was 300 miles out to sea. Now if you were a creepy crawly or a fishy wishy and here comes a wall of mud at you at 100 miles an hour, what would happen to you? You would swim and you'd go Ding! Where would you be? You would be an instant fossil. You would be covered in mud instantly. But I'm not going to talk about fossils. I'm going to talk about that next time. Alright, so here we've simulated a little bowl and here is a, an upland area. Here are some hills and mountain ranges and we're going to have a little earthquake and some of the shelf will break loose and it will flow over hills, over valleys, right across everything in the form of soft mud. There it goes. Can you see that it's flowing down the valley, up the valley? Can everybody see that quite clearly out there? Okay. And then it'll settle out. Now I want you to look at the next layer which will flow over the soft mud. By the way, it fills in the valley and it flows over the top and it's a nice soft mud layer. It flows over the valley, over the top. And as it fills it in, we can see that the bottom has, the valley has a much thicker layer. And that's what the geological column looks like. At the bottom, it's filling in valleys and at the top, it's straight. Now we have a second flow over the previous one. So we have a mud flow going over the mud flow. Notice how it swirls in the front there. Can you see that? Do you think it's possible that you could whip some of the bottom into the top? I mean the bottom is soft mud and you're rolling mud over mud. Is it possible as it swirls that some of the dark brown could go or the reddish mud can go into that brown layer? Yes or no? Okay, I like that. Here's another layer. Notice the swirling. And this is all happening in water. And it settles out and all of them are soft. Surprisingly little mixing. 
Next layer over the top of that. There we go. See how nicely it flows now? Everything's flattening out. And let's have another one over the top of that. This evolutionary process takes a while, so be patient. <laughs> there we go, there's another one. And there goes another one. Okay. Last one. Guaranteed. And now we're going to have a nice close look. What do you see? Well, you see layers and layers and layers, and they have got flat contacts, right? The contact is flat. That's exactly what it looks like in the Grand Canyon, yes or no? Yeah. Okay. And we continue and have a look at something else that's interesting. I hope that we can see it as we move in over here. And we move a little bit closer. I'll stop it over there. Can you see that at the bottom over here it's lumpy? There are some lumpy pieces over there. All right, that's because when you're putting rocks and stones and mud into water, what settles out first? The stones, the heavier stuff, and the mud higher up. So you have these graded cores to find. Now if they are graded cores to find, then they never ever formed over millions and millions of years. But they formed rapidly by some process such as this. It's the only explanation. And if you look at the contact lines, you see very little mixing. You would expect a lot more, wouldn't you? Incredibly, even with those bumps and swirls, very little mixing. But occasionally, you do see some mixing. And if you look closely, you would be able to see some mixing over there, for example. Can you see it? There are some places where you could actually find mixing. Okay, let's go into the world. Let's go to Switzerland. These have all been identified as turbidites. Those in Texas, they've been uprighted, uplifted. They were first flat. All those layers are turbidites. How do we know? They're great at course to find. All of those in Texas, these thick ones, there's huge ones, thinner ones, small tremor, thin layer. Huge tremor, big layer. Goes far, goes not so far. All turbidites. These turbidites over here in New Zealand, graded coarse to fine, ripple marks over there. This one over here, coarse to fine, all the way up. Next turbidite, coarse to fine. The whole geological column, everywhere in the world, no matter which continent you go to, has these turbidites and graded coarse to fine. What does that tell you? This tells you catastrophism, major catastrophe, and water was the consequence. Science say, whoa, 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 you're not telling me that the geological column formed rapidly and come with a short chronology. We have deserts in the, in the geological column. Like here at Zion Park, you have a dune which they say is desert. Wrong. This is not a desert dune, this is an underwater dune. The angle of deposition, the way, the size, everything about it talks of underwater dunes like you have at the mouth of the Amazon River. Later studies find that. So, you could have had continents in the beginning. No mountains like you have today. You have these continents up there, the pre-flood continents. The mountain ranges of today don't exist. So, don't say, how could the flood have covered the high mountains like Everest? They didn't exist. They weren't there. Then you depress the continent in the next one down and you lift the ocean floor and you pour the sediment over the land. That could answer why there is so much marine sediment on the land where it shouldn't be, and so little in the ocean bottom where it should be. Isn't that confusing? I would find that very confusing. And then you lift it up again, the continent, and this mud is in layers, and it slips and slides as you form these new mountain ranges, as you push them up through the process of orogeny, and of course, they slip and slide and fold. All right, let's have a look at some of the interesting contacts. We said, if they were both soft, 
it should be possible to mix two layers here and there. Did we say that? Okay, so you could have some mixing. Or if the bottom one was soft, you could depress and change the shape of the bottom one. This slide over here, I've shown it at many universities in many geological forums. It really is a nightmare slide because what you have here is two layers, one supposedly millions of years older than the other, and yet this is a turbidite flame. Can you see it? And this is not a bump standing out there that has been covered by the other one. No, this is a total mixture getting less and less and less as you go up. So this layer at the top rolled as a soft mud over the previous one, whipped some of the bottom into it, mixed it, and whoosh, carried on. So how old are those rocks in terms of their time spaced apart? We're talking catastrophe. We're not talking millions of years at all. Here is what we call a load cast, depression of the one into the other. So this layer over here is pushed into the other and you have compression zones in the bottom one, like somebody putting his foot into mud and going squish, you know, good, good, good. Not solid rock. Here is a mountain in the Alps that is folded in an S. There's another one. Look at that slipping and sliding. Now, how do scientists get these layers that are layers of rock that obviously formed like this, flat, folded like that? How do they do that? Well, if they're millions of years old, then they're solid rock, right or wrong. If they're solid rock and I'm going to go... <laughs> what happens then? <laughs> what happens to them? They must smash apart into thousands and thousands of rock chunks, am I right? But they don't. They fold. <laughs> so science has to put them into the bowels of the earth, heat them in the magma, push them up, fold them while they are hot, and then <laughs> there they are. But many of them have no sign of heat. Many of them are cold sediment deposits. Many of them have fossils in them, no sign of heat. This is very confusing. But if the layers were all soft, no problem. Take a look at that. This comes from Africa. The, you will notice the African ones are more exciting than any of the others. <laughs> Can you see that? Isn't that beautiful? Round it goes. <laughs> Next one over here. Look at that one. Down and... <laughs> up it goes. Beautiful folds in these mountains. All right. So science says each one was millions of years older than the previous one was solid rock. Now let's have a look at this over here. Very interesting feature. Here stands a finger. Ding! There it is. And it's standing there and the soft brownish rock over here, muddy sort of sandy stone, has been eroded away. But this fellow is slightly harder than it, so it's standing there. Where did it come from? Well, if you have a study of that, you'll see that it actually comes from the layers beneath. So in these rock layers here in Kodachrome Basin, you have these pillars going... And they're pushing through the layers of rock. Now, hang on a second. If each one of those is a solid sheet of rock, how do I squeeze the bottom one through the others? Is it possible? Only if I liquidize them, right? If I make them a liquid. If I have three layers of mud and I put some toothpaste tube underneath it and I go, squeeze, could I shoot the column <laughs> through them? Yes or no? Exactly. If I put pressure on a liquid, it actually forms columns like this. So I would like to suggest that all those layers were absolutely soft and that pressure from earth movement and earthquakes or whatever pushed up columns like this and there they solidified together leaving these stark reminders of a once uniform liquid consistency. Okay, evidence number one. The straight line shows that they must have formed rapidly. They were never the surface of the earth. They were wild. Where's the erosion? No sign of it. Flat. Second evidence. If they formed rapidly, they must have been soft. Is that right? We showed you evidence for soft. The third thing I would like to point out is that if there was a flood, there must be a lot of evidence of a lot of washout. Is that right? Okay. The Grand Canyon, for example, goes here. This is the map of the geology. There's the basin, the valley, and there's the, the uplifted area. It's a hill. And there's the Grand Canyon. Now, what formed it? The river. Now, do you know of any rivers today 
that travel and then go over the valleys to cut a crack in the middle. Do you know about anything like that? It's a major, major problem. The river is younger than the hill and there are differences and problems in getting the river to go over the hill. Impossible. Whereas with this model, the waters are covered by, the waters are covering the earth, then you have an upwarp over here, you lift up this portion quite rapidly, and as you lift it up quite quickly, is it possible it could crack at the top? If you lift it up at the bottom, like this? Sure. And it cracks and the water runs through, and you have an instant canyon. This is a relic of the flood and of a major water catastrophe. Nothing else. No matter where you go in the world, whether you go to the Grand Canyon, whether you go to Zion Canyon, now here you have a narrow little canyon all the way up to the top. In some areas you can touch the two sides. Incredible stuff. How did that form? There's some more of it. If you go to Africa and you go to Namibia, some beautiful erosional features as you see them over here. Wonderful stuff. And uh, the layers, just like everywhere else in the world, water marks, ripple marks, and the Fish River Canyon, not as spectacular as the Grand Canyon, but very peaceful. Not so many people and nice to walk in and very beautiful. And please notice something. You can see the layers, just like in the Grand Canyon, and the river itself, the canyon, is cut in a V-shape. Can you see that? It's V-shaped. Now that's very important, and don't forget it. Right around this meander, it's V-shaped. This is uh, the famous Ochrabis Falls. This is the Orange River Canyon. There it is. And if you look at that, you will also see it's much like, uh, like Zion. Sort of more sheer, but occasionally forming a V. And in the water, occasionally you see these rock washouts. And here's one, high up on the mountain, a what we call a whirlpool washout. Let me show you another one. There's another one. Isn't that beautiful? How did that form? Well, you see, have, who's ever sat next to a river and watched a whirlpool form? And it goes, and it's gone, right? Now, imagine the earth comes up, the water rushes down, there's a whirlpool, and it goes, and the water's gone. Could it have sucked some of the mud out? Yes or no? Absolutely. But what if that was solid rock? Would the whirlpool stay in one place and go <laughs> until it drilled the hole? Yes or no? Highly unlikely. Okay, some scientists say, you know, the stone went round and round and round. But this is high up in the mountains. These are... <laughs> I don't know what that is. Never mind. Here's one high up in the Cedarberg. <laughs> this rock was soft when this formed. Do you recognize this? That's the goosenecks. And please note again, you have the V-shape. Can you see that? And science would have us believe that this Colorado River took millions of years to wash out the goosenecks. But a scientist came along and he studied this in great detail, published it in uh, a very reputable journal, Science, and he said, you know, if it's V-shaped, it must be rapid. Because a slower time period would undercut and uh, you would have something like this. That must be rapid and that little piece down there must be undercutting, must be more slow. So that is post-catastrophe, that is catastrophe. Here is Canab Creek, the meander, washed out in a few seconds. Bryce Canyon, beautiful. If you haven't been there, you really must go. What washed out all this tremendous canyon? Was it millions of years of slow erosion or was it a rapid washout over time? And uh, look at the valleys and these beautiful rock formations that you see over there. I was there just when it snowed. Here is uh, another valley that's very interesting. This is Monument Valley. Can you see these monuments? Relics of layers that once were intact, contacted with one another. In between, everything is gone, but these stubborn little mounts are standing over there. Or those two. Those were the two most stubborn mountain sort of peaks that you can imagine. Everything in between has been washed away by millions of years of erosion, but those two guys refuse to move. <laughs> or is there another solution? Or those two, don't they look great? Navajo twins. While I was traveling here in Africa, 
And uh, what, I see, what you see here is a Basutu hut. And this is a donga. This is a rapid washout that happens after a rainstorm. And here you have it. And look what you see. Here you have a valley, all washed out. There you have a peak and 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 a peak. Now, millions of years of erosion washed everything in between away and these guys remained. But we know it was not like that. This was rapid. So increase the scale. Make the scale larger. Here's another donga sitting up there. It's not a rock hyrax. I think it is my wife. <laughs> and here you have V-shaped in this donga. So this again is rapid washout. Again up there in the mountain, these massive slits high up in the mountain. Rapid washout is the only explanation of this is absolutely phenomenal. If you look over here, you can see the mountain is undercut. Can you see that? So now how did that happen? Well, let's say these layers formed and then the waters rushed down as this continent was raised up. And this is mountain, so you have rushing water. And the water gets flat very quickly, shallow, and rushes down and starts with its force undercutting the mountain. But before everything is gone, the water is gone. And so we have the tunnels underneath. This, by the way, is next to a road where a highway's water comes off and the water flow in this area is so quick that it just cuts straight down. A little Zion Canyon. That is as deep as, you, as this roof. And it stays like that all the way down. From this rapidly shallow flowing water. Look at this guy sitting over there. Why is he there? I would like to suggest that it's not million year, millions of years of erosion because he's absolutely smooth underneath there. You can see the erosion on the top there. So what happened was this mountain range came up like that. The water rushed down the valley and before this rock was gone, what happened? The water was gone. And so it stood there solidified and you have these relics. So if you go into a valley and you see these mounts, sediments remaining over, you see these strange structures it's not such a problem anymore. If you take this one over here, this is Australia as rock. Millions of years of erosion either left it there and refused to take this thing away or the floodwaters took everything in between away. Now science will have you believe that that is not possible because it surely takes millions of years to rock for rock to form. Is that right? All right. How long does it take for rock to form? It depends on the conditions. That's the point. Depends on the conditions. Have a look at this slide. This is from the HMS Her Majesty's Service, Birkenhead, which sank off Danger Point in the Cape in 1852. And what you have over here is a piece of ceramic pottery over there and a bottle encased in solid rock. So you have two choices. Either that bottle and that ceramic pot are millions of years old, <laughs> Or, this rock didn't take so long to form. Here's another one. Here is a bell, a ship's bell, encased in solid rock. You have the same two choices. Either that's a millions of years old bell, or the rock formed rapidly. How long does it take for stalactites and stalagmites to form? They will tell you, millions of years. Well, here's one that formed when they pumped water to this district and it grew in front of their eyes. They got so excited they made a monument of it. <laughs> you see, it doesn't have to take millions of years. Crystals, gemstones, millions and millions of years of processes. Well, I was stunned. I was invited to this gemstone dealer, this very prominent gemstone dealer, and this individual was in tears. They had bought from a mine in the Congo, malachite very expensive gemstone and exported it to the United States for thousands and thousands of US dollars. It's good to export to the United States because you get lots of money because the dollar is so strong. And these malachite stones form in malachite caves only under certain conditions. Now you can see those pillars. This is an absolute superb example. It's probably worth about whatever. 30,000, 40,000 US dollars, this particular one over here. And then they exported these to the United States. And one of them broke in transit, and it was sent back. 
and what a shock awaited the gemstone dealer. Here you can see something sticking out. Can you see it? Do you know what that is? That's a wire. <laughs> and it's a copper wire. And if you look over there, there's another one. It's a copper wire. Let's enlarge that. It's absolute perfect malachite. No doubt, it's gemstone quality malachite. Millions of years for a rock like that to form. Here you have the wire. In their stress, they broke the next one, and guess what they found in the next one? A wire. And so now they know that the miners have figured out that under those circumstances in those caves, if they put wires there and they let the water run through the rocks which have the capacity to have all the elements for malachite, then the malachite forms rapidly. And within a few months, they can deliver the next batch and the next batch and the next batch. <laughs> So how many millions of years is it old? That is the question. How old is this island of Surtsey over here? Well, it's just a couple of months old and yet you can see the beaches are perfectly ground down. The island formed in 1967. Eight months after it formed, that is what was visible. I would like to suggest that there are two possible models. Of course, there are millions of questions in your minds, but just concentrate on the rocks. Is it possible that the rocks formed rapidly and that is why they are flat, that they formed catastrophically in water and that they were all soft and that the fossils in them are a record of something totally different, but you'll have to wait for the next exciting episode which comes straight after this one. 